not get like shall i start or no sir sunil will give a prompt okay okay so we are live okay good evening uh, everyone uh, i on behalf of entire cfs family welcome you to this uh, unique program uh, designed by santosh fanavar and this is called i focus and uh, very very popular program and uh, very very educative not only for pgs but for i think the entire ophthalmic community so santosh uh, you know design is that it covers from basics to advanced of each subject so we are today at 188th episode and 40th of the retina so uh, and we have with us uh, no other than giri we call him giri giridhar and uh, you see he is going to talk us about a disease with which he has lot of experience with which for which he has a lot of publications in fact giri as you know is a very very famous very very competent uh, retina man he has been the president of vrsi and uh, and uh, and made vrsi the 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 forum as we know it today a lot of uh, new things were done during his tenure i know that and he he is a no nonsense man man of very few words but believe me all those words are very very important you have to listen very very carefully very very important words he speaks and very relevant and i think the reason i think uh, we chose pcv as girish talk was because uh, he as i was saying has has uh, published and revised the entire management of pcv and he was one of the few people i remember in the world in fact who talked about oct features of pcv and uh, also said with very much uh, authenticity that pcv can be diagnosed with fair degree of accuracy without the gold standard icg and i have heard him so many times on this so i'll not take much time but uh, see during whatever problems he was having uh, during his uh, you know uh, uh, opening up the mat the lesson to be learned is don't lose heart in case of problem persist persist with patience and you will succeed so that is the message first thing i learned from you know don't lose heart persist with patience and you will succeed so over to giri and uh, he will talk to us about pcv thank you uh, thank you i mean i have to actually appreciate lalit because uh, he is uh, i mean for i think for the last 2 years he has literally literally been the torch bearer of zoom meetings in retina and uh, thank you santosh for giving me this uh, opportunity and actually i have to thank you because i am making a presentation on pcv after nearly 18 months and uh, you have really rekindled my interest because i literally opened my laptop and i saw the en encyclopedia of information that i have on this disease anyhow uh, thank you and in the next 45 minutes this is a pg resident program and therefore i'll be talking a lot on basics and uh, try to make this uh, talk as interesting as possible both to uh, post graduate students young ophthalmologists and also budding medical retina specialists so polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy actually was first described way back in 1982 by yanusi therefore it's about 40 years uh, back that uh, yanusi described this particular disease and uh, he described it as a disease which is uh, distinctive from uh, a, 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 actually from neovascular age related macular degeneration although many uh, publications subsequently said no there are many features similar to neovascular uh, age related macular degeneration so unfortunately in those days the diagnosis of polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy was based on icg angiography and this is an investigation which was having very poor access across the world and probably that's the reason why the asian population especially in china japan hong kong these are the countries where icg was used quite extensively and they re reported a very high incidence of nearly half the patients with wet age related macular de degeneration having a polypoidal type of a disease so what are the characteristic features that were described initially they were the subretinal polypoidal dilatations and the most important features of this disease which was even described way back in 
was the presence of significant exudation and presence of subretinal hemorrhage and hemorrhagic retinal pigment epithelial detachments. So over the years, probably we, because of multimodal imaging, our concepts have completely, I mean, e evolved. And, uh, you know, with the development of what they call as the pachycoroid spectrum, PCV was identified as a very important component of the pachycoroid spectrum. And many of the Western literature redefined this disease as what we call as an aneurysmal type 1 neovascularization. Now, when you see my subsequent presentation, you will understand what it is. And basically, we have to try and understand whether there is a natural progress from what we call as a pachycoroid pigment epitheliopathy. That is what happens if the choroid is thicker than normal. The outer choroidal vessels are dilated. They compress the inner choroid. And this results in ischemia of the outer retina. And that results in some sort of a degenerative change, what is called as a pachycoroid pigment epitheliopathy. And this probably can progress to neovascular disease. So PCV, therefore, although has been described with a thick choroid, very rarely we do see it with a thin choroid. Now, this is a picture taken from Yanusi's initial description, where you can see these abnormal network of vessels ending in these polypoidal dilatations. Now, this was described way back in 1982. And surprisingly, if you really see that basically the thing is that this is really true. When you come to see my subsequent presentation, you will understand that this is really true. Therefore, PCB, therefore, if you see the epidemiology of the disease, it's, more, it's common again in the same age group of patients who present with wet age-related macular degeneration, but probably a little earlier. And as I told you earlier, in the Asian population, the incidence is much more. Now, we had described way back in 20, 2010, I mean, we started working on polypoidal disease way back in 2006, and he was the person who was working with me at that time. He was one of our early fellows, and we made our first publication of a small set of patients with polypoidal disease, where we showed a male preponderance of the disease, and we also found that the exudative type is more common than the hemorrhagic type of the disease. Now, I will divide my presentation into three or four parts. One is the stand clinical presentation, the SD-OCT features, little bit on ICG angiography, and finally on management and some take-home messages. So these are some of the characteristic clinical presentations. One, presence of a submacular hemorrhage. So when you see patients with isolated submacular hemorrhage, small, medium, or little large, probably, and especially in a middle-aged patient, who does not have any other coexisting disease, probably you're dealing with a, 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 a polypoidal disease. Second is what we call as an exudative type. Now you can see here a clump of exudate. Now when you see exudation, you must remember, it's also seen in patients with classic wet age-related macular degeneration. But what is different in this particular condition is that you don't see the neovascular membrane. So normally in a classic type 2 or a type 3 choroidal neovascular membrane, you also see this typical grayish membrane adjacent to the exudation, which you normally do not see and sometimes carefully, if you see, you may see this orangish nodule. You can see here, then orangish change here. That is possibly the polypoidal network. So just to see the picture again, enlarge. The third type is what we call as a zero sanguinous type. Here you can see there is fluid, but very carefully, if you see, there is a, sting, a, a small string of subretinal hemorrhage also. And this again is another form of a presentation of polypoidal disease. And finally, the mixed type, where we have hemorrhage with a lot of exudation. When you see a patient like this, a middle-aged patient like this, with no evidence of any vascular occlusion or anything like that, and definitely this is a patient with polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. So these are the various clinical presentations. Now, we recently, again, about a couple of years ago, we looked into our data of about 140 patients, and we found that basically the average age, again, was about 60 years, and you can see the types of presentations here. Hemorrhagic was about 53%, and probably it was more or less equally distributed. But what is more interesting, and the reason why I'm showing you this particular slide is, you can find drusen in some person. That is, nearly 27% of the eyes with polypoidal disease did have drusen. That's why, you know, there is the concept is changing that whether it is a variant of neovascular age-related macular degeneration. 
So <clears throat> basically, the, here the, the, the male and female preponderance was a little different. We had more female patients. Therefore, they, really, there's no preponderance of males and females, I think, it's seen equally. So these are the main clinical features and the epidemiology. I move into the OCT biomarkers of polypoidal disease. Now, these are the, this is a classic. If you're seeing this, you can just take a picture. These are classic pigment epithelial detachment. You must remember one thing in polypoidal disease, we do get PEDs. Why do we get PEDs? Because this neovascular network is growing between the Brooks membrane and the retinal pigment epithelium. And therefore the polypoid, when it leaks, it lifts the retinal pigment epithelium. So if you see here, this notch is very important. And if you see very carefully, you see this cavitation here. This is the polypoidal vessel. So you are seeing the polypoidal vessel here. This is leaking underneath and lifting the retinal pigment epithelium. And these sort of characteristic PEDs, the notch PED, the tall peak PED, and you can see the notch PED. And then this sort of a thumb-shaped PED where you see this hyperreflectivity just under the, this thing. And the most important feature is that when you see any of these types of PEDs with serous macular detachment, I always say in my presentation that you don't see intraretinal fluid in classic polypoidal disease. Unlike in wet age-related macular degeneration, either a type 2 or a type 3, where intraretinal fluid is a very important characteristic feature, in characteristic polypoidal disease, you do not see IRF. It's only serous macular detachment with these classic pigment epithelial detachments. There are other interesting aspects of STOCT. Actually, STOCT has made us understand the pathogenesis of the disease. Now, this is a publication. Actually, this work, I should not take credit. It was run down by one of my fellows who worked with us for a couple of years, and Divya Alex. And this was a very interesting presentation of the importance of the lateral flat pigment epithelial detail. Now, this is what we call as a flat irregular PD, where the ret retinal pigment epithelium is irregular. There is a separation from the Brooks membrane. And this is where the neovascular network grows, as Yanusi initially described. Now, if you see here in this particular state, this is a follow-up of a patient with asymptomatic disease. Now, this was uh, like this. It enlarged a little bit like this. And subsequently, you can see the fluid coming in. Therefore, the neovascular network has become active. And slowly, you can see at the end, you can see the slow elevation. This is the pigment epithelium. Therefore, this is a neovascular network, which ends in the polypoidal vessel here, which lifts the retinal pigment epithelium. And slowly, you can see it growing again. So this is basically, we described this, and thanks to Hanawa, this was published in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, both as a case report and also as a paper, where we described this evolution of a, of a flat irregular PED into a neovascular disease, just showing you, and see the ICG. This ICG was taken initially, where you don't see any network, and here the ICG shows the poly. Probably at this stage, if you had done an octa, you might have seen a neovascular network. But nonetheless, the evolution of the disease from a flat, irregular PED and or a small double-layered sign, progressing into a pachycoral neovasculopathy and subsequently to a, to a polypoidal disease. So this again is a follow-up of the ICG over a period of time where you can see it was like this, it progressed like this, and it progressed further like this. Therefore, I just showed you. Therefore, I just, I'm showing you this picture again. Therefore, what Yanisi described is absolutely correct. He did not have any of these uh, modern facilities, but still he could really describe the evolution of this disease. Another important uh, uh, OCT feature is what we call the double layer sign. Actually, we described this many years ago, but unfortunately, you know, I mean, I have to again tell Honava that, you know, IGO articles are not being, uh, I mean, uh, what you call, uh, citations are very poor because subsequent articles have not mentioned about this beautiful work that was done. Again, this actually, this, uh, this particular piece of work was done by me uh, along with my uh, old fellow, Dr. Jai Shet, because in one meeting, actually, Dr. Jai Chablani asked me a question that why CSR also has a double layer sign, pachycoral polypoidal disease also has a, a double layer sign. Now, how is it different? So I came back and we picked up all the charts of patients with central serous retinopathy and uh, uh, polypoidal disease. Therefore, in CSR also, you do see a DLS, that is the separation of the retinal pigment epithelium from the Brooks membrane, and you can see a small space here. I thought this is a very important feature, but then if you see, compare the two, one, this is much smaller. And this is seen only in about 25 to 30% of patients with, uh, with central serous retinopathy. 
unlike in polypoidal disease where we see in about 95 patients 95% of patients with polypoidal disease have a double legged sign therefore it's a very important feature therefore and but and another thing is the space between the brooks membrane and the retinal pigment epithelium you see this hyper reflectivity that's the exudation which you don't see in central serous courier retinopathy therefore dls is a very important feature and if you take the oct scan through the icg through the network and the polypoid you will see that at the point of the network you have this small elevation at the point of the polypoid you have this pigment epithelial detachment so uh, this is the most important feature so i'm coming now to icg angiography now you know icg angiography is definitely a very useful tool and what icg angiography does and what oct probably cannot do is probably oct will not be able to you know uh, identify the complete uh, network unlike an icg angiography so we did another small study to find out as uh, dr uh, lalit verma said many years ago this was uh, presented in the asrs couple of years ago is icg angiography necessary in polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy what we did is, did is that we studied the sensitivity and specificity of all the types of pigment epithelial detachments and we found that the notch pd had a 2.35% uh, greater uh, i mean possibility of uh, diagnosing a, a polypoidal disease than any other form of a pigment epithelial detachment and also we also looked into we also did this was basically a study where the, the the investigator did not have access to the icg angiography and he was asked to identify the peds which possibly are harboring the polyp and also try and identify the area where the polypoidal disease was there with and that that was finally and that was counter checked by another investigator with the icg angiography and we found a good Uh, i mean uh, agreement between the oct and the icg angiography and that's when we thought that probably it is not really necessary in such i mean all patients with polypoidal disease to have a icg angiography done it's important to know what are the pcv mimickers now this is a patient with a serous macular detachment this looks like central serous courier retinopathy now most important thing for all youngsters is when you do an oct scan always scan the full macula don't just take a single scan now if you look, look at this scan this looks like a central serous courier retinopathy but then when you do the complete scan you see this again what has been described by me as the flat irregular pd and once you see this and especially if it's a middle aged gentleman this is probably not csr it is possibly a polypoidal disease and you can see here this particular patient with icg angiography you can see the network and some of these networks ending in a polypoidal dilatation therefore central serous courier retinopathy like presentation probably especially in middle aged person is one of the most important mimickers of both acticoroid neovasculopathy and polypoidal disease and this is just show you the multimodal imaging of the same patient this is another very interesting case which i just saw about 3 or 4 days back i thought this would be very good for this presentation now this is an, a wide angle photography you see this here you see this uh, pig, i mean uh, the, that this pigmented track here and this is we all know that this is a very important feature of central serous courier retinopathy if you see here you can see this here and uh, this uh, this uh, pigment track this is actually the percolation or gravitation of the subretinal fluid down but then when you do the oct when i when we see this elevation and then when you see here as we pass the oct here this particular peak peak pd we know that possibly this is not central serous courier retinopathy but possibly this is a case of polypoidal disease and the patient underwent icg angiography and you can see the polyp right where the pigment i mean you see this pd just where the pd is there you see this polyp and this patient therefore is not csr but it's a case of a polypoidal disease therefore oct has got immense application as far as this uh, diagnosis is concerned so this is the initial definition as to when an icga should be done this is this is the this is basically described in the guidelines for polypoidal uh, choroidal vasculopathy and i'll just show you two or three points in icg angiography before i move into management one is in icg angiography the first few minutes are very important therefore when you are clicking the pictures you should start clicking immediately because if you see nodular hyperfluorescence occurring in the first 5 to 6 minutes of the injection of the dye then possibly you are dealing with polypoidal disease now what are the important features now you see this nodular hyperfluorescence 
surrounded by hypo. Now, this is very characteristic. What is this hypo? That is the fluid that is collected around the polypoidal disease, which is uh, obstructing the fluorescence or a cyanescence or whatever you want to say. So this is the classic ICG picture of polypoidal disease. And if you take the OCT through the polyp, you can see the pigment epithelial detachment. What are the applications? Applications is even in the presence of hemorrhage, you can see the, uh, you know, the polyp. So this is a patient, large hemorrhage here, but you can see the string of polyps here in this particular ICG angiography. There's another patient with hemorrhage here. In spite of the hemorrhage, you are seeing this network here. You can network of vessels, what we call as a branching vascular network earlier. Therefore, on based on ICG, we can classify polypoidal disease into subfovial, extrafovial, and extrafovial or peripapillary, peripapillary, whatever you want to call it. Therefore, you can classify the disease and you can also see the complete extent of polypoidal disease. Therefore, this is a peripapillary one in the papillomacular bub muddle. So, I mean, it just also shows the complete design of the polypoidal disease. Now, this was described as what is known as a bola sign. I mean, basically, you can see these polypoids all around like a ring. And if you want to do PDT, you know, it's easy. In those days when we now PDT is not available, you can identify and you can just, I don't think it's possible to completely map the polypoidal disease with the, with the, with the sub, I mean, spectral domain OCT. So I have described the investigations, the diagnosis. Now I'm moving into the management. Now, what is the natural cause? Just like wet AMD, the natural cause of PCV is unfavorable. There's only one study which has studied the natural cause many, many years ago. Therefore, nearly 50% of the eyes lose, uh, result in significant visual loss in the first 12 to 24 months. Therefore, it is important for us to treat these patients and it's important for us to educate these patients what happens if left untreated. So as far as the treatment of polypoidal disease is concerned, we all know there are three forms of treatment. First is the combination therapy with vertiform and PDT. Second is the anti of monotherapy. And there are a small percentage of patients which may benefit with thermal laser photocoagulation. So the combination therapy has got level one evidence based on two important trials. That's the Everest one and the Everest two trials. And uh, I'll come to it later. But I would like to say a few words on thermal laser for polypoidal disease. So thermal laser even now can be used for a very selected group of patients where we see polyps quite far away from the fovea. I mean, one of the disadvantages of a thermal laser is you may be treating the polyp, but you may not be treating the network. So probably the treatment may be inadequate. Number two is that if the you know, area of involvement is large, you can create a scotoma. So it is not ideal to treat uh, the, the, these uh, patients which are very close to the fovea because you may create a scotoma. But if you have any lesion a little far away from the center of the fovea, I feel still, even I use it in my practice today, I do give thermal laser because it's a very uh, cost-effective form of a treatment. It's an effective treatment. Therefore, this patient had this polyps here and this was treated here and post-treatment, you know, you can see this photograph. Actually, I'll enlarge it for you. You can you see the photograph. You can see those, uh, you know, the laser marks there. So you treat the polyp and a little bit around it so that, and then you have the, the, the treatment parameters are similar to what we used to do many years ago in patients with a coronal neovascular membrane. You need to use a higher duration burns and you need to whiten it and you need to give confluent burns. So this is another very nice case to show you how, you know, thermal laser works. So you can see this excavation has completely reduced uh, significantly. In fact, later when the patient came, it had completely disappeared totally. Therefore, it doesn't recur. Therefore, you're able to kill the disease with this particular form of a treatment. So <clears throat> coming to photodynamic therapy for polypoidal disease, subfovial, peripapillary, large areas in extrafovial region also, probably this is the form of a treatment. Now, this is one of my early cases, which was treated in our hospital many years ago. What I want to tell you is that even in the presence of hemorrhage with a camera-based ICG, you could see this network. And with the treatment, even in the presence of hemorrhage, you can see what's the form of a resolution that we get with uh, combination therapy. So what does combination therapy do and how is it different from anti vegetative monotherapy and why is it that if or probably Visudine is available in future, probably there may be a selected number of patients in whom we may advise uh, uh, a combination therapy. 
one of the important reasons is you get a long, a long period of quiescence. Now, this particular patient has had multiple PDTs over a period of eight to nine years. And if you see here for two and a half, three years, the patient was asymptomatic. So for, for two and a half, three years, the patient did not have any treatment at all. It was a quiescent period. So pro, and number two is that you see some of these patients, in spite of multiple treatments, they maintain good vision. Now, this is one of my very early patients with about 10 years, 11 years follow-up. Even now, the patient has got normal vision. Well, acuity. So I just mentioned to you about the Everest trial, which was the first, I mean, the randomized trial that looked into the use of a PDT combination therapy in uh, polypoidal disease. And the Everest 2 trial in results, if you see the, the most important difference between anti vegf monotherapy and, uh, and uh, uh, combination therapy is, of course, polyp regression. Although the newer modern anti vegf agents are giving us more percentages of uh, poly polyp regression. The in earlier anti vegf agents like ranibusumab and bevacizumab, the polyp regression was only in about 25 to 30 patients when compared to about 60 percent that would achieve with with uh, with uh, combination therapy. And that's why you know the results of the trial were more, more favorable towards the combination therapy with PDT. So I will show you another very interesting case just to show you the evolution of the disease. Now this particular patient had a polypoidal disease. She was treated many years ago with multiple injections of ranibizumab with very, very poor response. You can see here, there's hardly any change in the subretinal fluid. And you can see here, in spite of ranibizumab, the network is actually increasing. At that point of time, the patient underwent reduced fluid PDT. And after PDT, you know, she completely recovered. As you can see here on the right this side, you can see that it's completely, there's no serious macular detachment. Even the PD height has reduced. And this patient has been under our follow-up for nearly now 10 years. Now, after a gap of about four and four, 42 months, the patient had a recurrence just before the pandemic. And subsequently, she has been treated with aflibersive injection as a, <clears throat> on, a, on a PRN basis. And you can see here that with aflibersive, you do need to give the injections at least once in eight weeks. And uh, the patient actually was, I mean, is willing for another PDT in case Vesuvide is available because uh, she's finding taking these injections on about eight to 10 weeks interval quite tedious. And also not that, although the cost has decreased, it's not very, I mean, it's really not uh, compliant as far as the patient is concerned. So what I want to show you here is that, you know, the PD size is really not decreasing much. Thereby, once the, if you see that the notch PD is not decreasing in height, that means the neovascular network is really not regressing. Therefore, the treatment-free duration was 42 months in this sort of this in, a, in, a, in, a, in this particular patient. Therefore, we looked into the long-term efficacy and safety of PDT mono combination therapy. And in this particular paper, what we have found is 42.5 percent of the 40 eyes did not have any recurrence in SDOCT with a minimum follow-up of mean follow-up of 27 months. That is more than two years. So <clears throat> that's quite a long period of time that you can get uh, patients into uh, a quiescent period without any injections or without any form of treatment. So <clears throat> I now come to the use of uh, 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 in 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 in. in, uh, in uh, in, uh, in PCV and aflibursa probably is what's one of the first molecules with, who, with which we could get polyp regression, uh, with, uh, I mean, with anti of injections. But what I want to tell you all is that this is a very, very temporary phase. So this particular patient had polyp regression, but actually within two to three months, the polyps have recurred again. So it's not that, you know, it works for a long period of time. So the patient needs to have uh, uh, continuous injections. So this patient, you can see here that it had regressed and slowly you can see the recurrence of the polyps. Therefore, the, you need to treat these patients, keep the patients on a regular follow-up. Therefore, the difference between ranibizumab and aflibersib is aflibersib gives about 60% of polyp closure when compared to ranibizumab is about 30 to 33%. But nonetheless, you know, these patients will need regular follow-up. And this patient also was switched to uh, PDT with the bevacizumab uh, subsequently, and there was complete uh, resolution. And this patient is again under our follow-up. Therefore, summarizing the role of anti vegf therapy for polypoidal disease, it does result in improvement of visual acuity. It results in resolution of small submacular hemorrhages. Its weakness is uh, basically poor regression of polyps in ICG. Uh, some of the anti -VEGF, earlier anti-VEGF agents are poor responders. 
Now, as I told you earlier, the, the PCV can occur with thin choroid, and I would like to share one particular patient which has been under my treatment for quite some time. Now, this is a classic case of polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. This is the PED, and this is the polypoidal network. And if you see here, the patient has got a large uh, uh, pigment epithelial, thumb-shaped pigment epithelial detachment with a large serous macular detachment and also the double-layered sign. All the characteristic features were there. This patient was initially treated with aflibercept, but after two doses of aflibercept, I did not see any change either in the serous macular detachment or in the height of the pigment epithelial detachment. At that point of time, I felt that we need to, and pr prior to that, she had had two doses of ranibizumab. So at that point of time, I thought I need to change and I shifted to the new drug called prolisizumab. And this is the uh, OCT taken just before the first injection of brolisizumab. So the patient received two doses of brolisizumab at six weeks interval. And you can see here after two doses, there is significant regression, not only disappearance of the macular detachment, but most importantly, the pigment epithelial detachment has reduced significantly, meaning thereby probably the neovascular network also has regressed. Therefore, in this particular patient, we found that brolisizumab was quite promising. So summarizing, therefore, aflibercept can achieve polyclosure, although for a shorter period, Brolyacizumab appears to be promising. We still do not have much data on that. But nonetheless, most patients in uh, with PCV who are on monotherapy with anti vegf will need what we call as a treat and extend treat uh, regimen because uh, basically these are patients who come back with early recurrence. So summarizing my presentation where I looked into the clinical features, the OCT features, the ICG features, and the management, PCV, I feel, is a distinct clinical entity which has got distinctive biomarkers, each biomarker features in OCT. Is it a variant of wet age-related macular degeneration? It can be because there are patients where in one eye we get a classic polypoidal disease, in the other eye we get a different type of a picture. Therefore, it could be a variant of wet age-related macular degeneration. It's a chronic disease like any other patient with wet age late macular degeneration requiring continuous monitoring and treatment. More recent anti drugs are more effective and its course probably is slightly different from type 2 on type 3 C-coroidal neovascular membrane. I would like to you know, show this particular uh, case before I wind up where you know you can see here the, 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 the response uh, to the uh, treatment. Thank you all for your kind presentation. Yeah, okay, I mean, thank you all, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you, Gary, thank for you. Uh, this lovely talk. I don't think so. In uh, half an hour, anybody could have uh, taught us P uh, PCV in such a lucid way, actually. Uh, we can stop sharing uh, if you want, yeah, Gary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the format of our, you know, this educated program is uh, after the talk, we pay attention to the questions. Actually, we have to solve all the issues which, uh, you know, our front uh, uh, benches ask. So uh, one question which has been asked, which uh, you have to reply is, in how many diseases come yeah. under the pachycoroid spectrum? You see, pachycoroid spectrum, uh, as yeah. we all know, is, yeah. uh, is, a, is a spectrum which keeps expanding. And we have recently started, you know, understanding all the things which come under it. So can you please reply to this, Giri? Yeah, pachycoroid uh, spectrum, from what I have understood, is uh, it's a very evolving uh, 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 terminology. Of late, there are a lot of questions that are being asked about the definition itself. And uh, in the original description, we had pachycoroid pigment epitheliopathy, pachycoroid choroidal, uh, new, I mean, PCN, pachycoroid neovasculopathy, polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, then we had uh, central serous retinopathy. So these were the main uh, diseases that were initially, you know, classified as uh, pachycoroid spectrum. Then there are so many other things like, you know, focal choroidal excavation and uh, so many other entities, which you now slowly people are, I mean, you know, uh, uh, defining in the pachycoroid spectrum. But uh, uh, I mean, I think these are the main in, uh, entity, clinical entities which come under the pachycoroid spectrum. So, Rajneesh, you got your answer that, you know, starting from uh, uh, pigment epithelopathy, then uh, new vascularization, then CSR, then, uh, and you see there have been some patients who show the evolution from one part to the other. But all of us should remember pachycoroid means not only thick choroid, but 
also the features which i think giri had told in the beginning that it is the a trophy of the inner layers and you know uh, the 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 audio capillaries and the, and the and the uh, satellites layer and the hyaluronic layer vessels become prominent which push and cause uh, cause the uh, spectrum of pcv so one other question which i think is yeah. uh, answer is very clear steroid role in pcv is there any yeah. evidence uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, actually, there is no level evidence as far as uh, intraorbital steroid is concerned. Now, there are a couple of, I mean, when do I use? I use uh, a combination, when I do PDT, I usually, in many patients, I immediately give, we, we give within the first 12 hours, either one milligram of Primesilon or a little bit of dexamethasone uh, because PDT causes inflammation and uh, this is a very good anti-inflammatory. That is my application of intravital steroid in uh, polypoidal disease, especially, you know, when we have these patients who have received either bevacizumab or ranibizumab and are poor responders, there is no use combining PDT with that anti vegf because the, that doesn't have any, any, any effect at all. So initially, it's better to give steroid. But having said that, there is a group I know which has claimed that oral steroids are quite effective in uh, polypoidal disease. And I think there is a group from LVP which has also used intravital steroid uh, for polypoidal disease. They have claimed that uh, basically it gives very good response. So I mean, but can we say? But but can we say there is no level one evidence to? No, uh, you definitely no say. There definitely is no, there say. Is no evidence. I don't think that we should. No. Use it, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you, we should use intravital steroids to treat uh, polypoidal disease because there is no evidence. So so any what uh, Giri has said is. There's no level of an evidence to show that intravital steroids should be used. In fact, none of his uh, more than 100 slides he showed had any slide on intravital steroids. If it was, I think Giri would definitely raise his point. There are any total reports about usage of steroids to maximize the visual results or to counter the inflammation produced by the other agents. But steroid per se alone, no role. Can I say this, Giri? Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. true. So alone, no role. No role. So any other question... Uh, uh, Dr. Deepti or Miriam, anybody has? Yes, sir, there are a couple of questions. So let, let me let me ask this also. How sure. uh, Sohini has again asked, uh, how many settings of PDT needed? If because PDT Sohini presently because Verti person is not available, so PDT presently is out of work. But uh, she wants to know how many settings are usually required. No, actually, usually only one sitting of PDT is required, uh, doctor. I mean, uh, yeah, we have never given uh, PDT more than one uh, sitting immediately. I mean, uh, it's very risky to give PDT uh, immediately. That is, you do, for, see, when you do PDT combination therapy, the end point of treatment is about three months, two to three months. Now, at the at about two to three months, if you're having some residual fluid, etc., you will have to give a couple of more. And I, what we normally used to do earlier is that at three months, we used to do a repeat ICG angiography. Because once you do a repeat ICG angiography, you know whether the polyp regression is reasonably good. And if the polyp regression is reasonably good and it's just a leaking branching network, you will have to treat that with a little bit of more anti of injection. Therefore, one, number one, Never give PDT again immediately because it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a, 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 an invasive treatment. It can destroy healthy tissue, number one. Number two is in our experience, I think the earliest intervention we have done is about 12 months after the initial treatment, not earlier than that. So in our experience, most patients do reasonably well with one cycle of PDT. And the, other part was, the other part was about the fluence. Uh, do you always use full fluence? or? Uh, uh, we use mostly, we were using full fluence PDT, uh, even in patients with reasonably good vision, unless and until the patient has got a very small, like I showed one or two cases with very small lesions, small part of lesion in the subfoveal area where the size of the lesion is very small. So when you have a very small size of the lesion and when the spot size is so small, and if you do a full fluence, obviously you're giving too much of heat there. So if you have a small size lesion, I would prefer to do a half fluence, especially if it is subfluvial. But otherwise, I think most patients, I, we give full fluence PDT because our idea is to get the best results with one shot of treatment. So any other question, uh, Deepthi? Before uh, I ask Ritesh to, you know, uh, say something. Uh, Ritesh is there. You can ask. Is yeah, because a lot of, we, our main aim is to answer questions from this yeah. uh, hot seats. Yeah. I mean, DRF people are more uh, knowledgeable than us. 
<laughs> yeah, Deepthi. So, sir, the question that stands out the most is, I think, something that Dr. Girida mentioned right at the beginning of his talk and also concluded with, which is whether the pachycoroid spectrum is a separate entity or if it's a variant of AMD. Uh, I think Dr. Girida has made it clear that he believes that it's a separate entity. I think, uh, would you, would Dr. Lalit or Dr. Ratesh would like to comment the remark on this debatable issue? You see, we, uh, yes, Ritesh, after you. You can unmute, yeah. Ritesh, you can unmute, yeah. My, my signal was off. So what I heard was you want to know whether it's uh, PCB and uh, CSR. No, um, Pachycoroid. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. wants to know whether, uh, yeah, whether PCB is a variant of wet AMD. Is it a, I mean, she wants to know what is your opinion. Is so, it a variant or is it a distinct separate clinical entity? Especially yeah. when there's a patient with a thin choroid. That's a difficult one. So there's a lot of overlap between the two entities. We earlier had a lot of relief in, uh, there was an entity wherein we used to say this is a polypoidal variant of CNVM, which further modified as PCB. And then we started considering them as two separate entities. And uh, now again, there are reports which have started to again, start keeping them both as close to each other as possible. But clinically, if you ask me, there are certain very distinct features which keep the two entities still from my end a little separate from each other. Uh, the presence of two cells, which is much more common in uh, wet AMD, not that commonly seen in PCV. The amount of hemorrhagic changes that you see in PCV are a lot more compared to those seen in wet AMD. Presence of intraretinal fluid, which is a lot more common in wet AMD, not seen in PCV, are very separate, distinct entities. Yeah, the debate is on and off, on and off going on. For me, as of now, I am considering them both as two separate entities. PCB is a part more of pachycoroid spectrum, which evolves from pachycoroid pigment epithelopathy to exudative fluid as CSR, neovasculopathy, and a PCB. And wet AMD as a distinct entity. So that's. I agree deeply that I think. Uh... By and large, it's a separate uh, entity. Although we say in Japanese and Asian, it's it, it, uh, around 25 to 50 percent of patients may be having PCV. But the classical teaching had been once you see a big subretinal hemorrhage or or a large lot of exudation, in the absence of drusen, you think of PCV as the main. And PCVZ has a distinct features which we do not see in AMD, which Giri so showed six OCT features and and this orange colored nodules which you do not see in, in uh, ARMD. And also the ICG is, is still, I think, the gold standard. Also, OCT uh, has these features. ICGs, those, those uh, you know, ugly phases, uh, nodules, which you do not generally see in ARMD. So although we are all learning and evolving, there are, like Giri said, in thin core also the RN secret 25-27% may have truce and also, but that still, I think, uh, is in a part of a pecky choroid spectrum. By and large, uh, that's what the general belief is. And uh, more, more on one more point, uh, uh, Deepti, is that, see, it's important to differentiate and uh, see it as a distinct entity because once you see polypoid disease, I think we will not give ranibizumab or bevacizumab if the patient can afford. We will straight away go into aflipercep or any of the newer drugs. So, whereas, uh, you know, the other types do respond to ranibizumab so, or bevacizumab. So, that's that all. again. Yeah, I agree. That again shows that the disease primarily, yeah. you see with this newer agent, especially the Paginex and Brolucimab, the whenever the disease is, uh, you know, uh, below RPE or that uh, DLS, what you see, these agents work better. Specifically, therefore, in type 1 CNVM, PEDs and, and IPCV, these agents seem to work better compared to the classic uh, ARMD, where we, we resort to ranimizumab very often. So today, uh, this was my other uh, take home. Uh, I wanted to extract from Giri that today, if you have to use only anti vegf agents because uh, uh, non-availability of 40%, yeah. so which agent number one will you prefer? I would prefer, I mean, looking into safety and efficacy, I would prefer uh, aflibercept. Yeah. So all of us have shifted, actually. We no longer use Avastin. We no longer use Ranimizumab in patients of PCV. But we start, in fact, with Ilia. And sometimes we shift to Brolisimab and uh, uh, because of the same reason. Right. Um, so the next question is to do with ICE, uh, OCT angio. So um, PCV being a diagnosis on ICGA, 
how useful is OCT angio in diagnosing PCV? I think Dr. Gerdar showed us evidence that OCTA is comparable with ICGA, but what are the absolute advantages of ICGA and what, is the, what are the absolute limitations of OCTA when it comes to PCV? Okta, actually, the reason why I didn't talk about Okta is because I thought this is a, I mean, a talk for residents. So I thought why unnecessarily bring in too many things, new, new things into it. Uh, we have actually done a small study where we have compared Okta with uh, uh, ICGA. And we have shown a reasonably good, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what you call uh, uh, comparison with, uh, to identify the network, the area of the network with Okta uh, when compared to ICGA. But having said that, there are many limitations. One is when you have a lot of fluid, when you have a lot of exudation, when you have hemorrhage, all these things can act as an impediment uh, to um, really, you know, uh, uh, identifying the complete network, especially to see the polyps. You may see a network, but then you may not be able to see the polyps as such. So that's probably the the, the limitation of Okta in uh, in uh, PCV. So otherwise, uh, in, uh, if you don't have these sort of changes, actually, I didn't have. I mean, I didn't show that slide. We have shown one or two uh, cases where. We have beautifully delineated with the octa, the, the branching vascular network, and the polyps in one or a couple of cases. So, Deepti, I think my personal take of this would be octa is definitely an emerging tool, non invasive, but there are limitations, as Giri said. If it is positive, it's very good, but it can be negative in a lot of these patients. Yeah. yeah. So, gold standard, I would still say, remains ICGA uh, because of the benefit that it picks up those polyps. In Okta, you may pick up. That's very good. That surely helps. But if it does not, does not rule out. Yeah. For example, that patient with thin choroid, where yeah. it's simply elderly lady, actually, when they have large PEDs, it's very difficult to do an Okta. And uh, you will not be able to... Actually, that particular patient, we couldn't identify any network because I didn't want, I was not very keen to do an ICGA. And uh, finally, I did an ICGA just to confirm the diagnosis, although I knew. So that is another... Uh, 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 I mean, uh, disadvantage of Okta. So when you have large PEDs, it's very difficult. Yes, so sir, other question? The, the, yes, uh. the PGs would like to know the mechanism of PDT. And also, could you elaborate on low fluence PDT? Uh, mechanism, actually, I had that slide. Unfortunately, you know, in all this, uh, the mess I was in for about five minutes, my actually the last edited presentation was not the one that I presented. It was the one that I prepared earlier to that. So in that uh, last edited presentation, I had uh, one or two slides on photodynamic therapy. So photodynamic therapy, basically, we use vertipoffin and uh, we use uh, six milligram per square centimeter. And uh, basically, it's given over a period of 10 minutes. And then subsequently, we show a 689 nanometer special laser. The laser itself is very different. Therefore, it's a, therefore this is a photosensitive dye that we are injecting that selectively collects within this network and uh, basically and when we show that uh, the, 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 the laser is absorbed by the photosensitive dye and this is a photochemical reaction that occurs which destroys the abnormal vascular network. You see DPS as I understand the, the thing is because Giri uh, talked about thermal laser also. You see, the reason there is a difference in the response between interval injection vis-a-vis -vis, uh, PDT or laser is because aim is to somehow kill the polyp, kill the polyp. You see, uh, on because the end point in treatment, to my thinking, I remember uh, sharing dice with Giri in one of the end we had debate, is 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 polyp disappearance, which cannot cannot happen with the injections. Therefore, you require continued injections. You cannot, uh, you know, depend on injections and forget about it. Whereas with PDT, he has shown even the 10 years also, sometimes patient may do very well. So with PDT, advantage is that the polyp, which is the cause, which is the ultimate cause in uh, for hemorrhage or for uh, exudation, we, we, we make the polyp disappear. Okay. So is there, a, is there a peripheral variant of PCV? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about so, peripheral I was coming to that actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so your peripheral variant. Yeah, peripheral PCV is actually, as far as the peripheral PCV is concerned, uh, basically as far as, I mean, what do you want to know about the management diagnosis? Diagnosis of peripheral PCV is by ICG angiography. 
because you need a wide angle OCT if you want to diagnose it, it's possible. So you need to do ICG angiography. Patients usually present with peripheral uh, sub, uh, subretinal hemorrhages or uh, sub-RP hemorrhages. And uh, management uh, depends on the size, extent, etc. It's a it's a small peripheral. Hem I mean, if it is little bit in the periphery, you know, it's I mean, it's accessible by thermal laser. You can even give thermal laser. Suppose you know it's just outside the uh, you know the central uh, thirty or thirty five degrees, and if it's distant peripheral, and if there's a small uh, subretinal hemorrhage or hemorrhage, and you're able to identify the polyps, and possibly you know you can give thermal laser. If it's a slightly large, some of these patients which are slightly large hemorrhage, which is little peripheral, which is not affecting the vision, I may even just follow up these patients without any form of treatment. I may not give anti of injection because by giving anti of injection, I may trigger something. So because some of these, these things are self-resolving, you know. But when I see that the hemorrhage is increasing in size and this thing, I may give uh, intravitreal ilia. It works again. Because there are patients with peripheral PCV, which I have seen with uh, subretinal hemorrhages here and there, with a lot of exudation also, with multiple injections of anti of aflipercept, they responded extremely well. And then, very rarely, you can get massive, uh, you know, I mean, breakthrough hemorrhages. If they get breakthrough hemorrhages, we do vitrectomy, even though because they don't absorb. And usually, one of the paradoxical features of uh, peripheral PCV, especially when they have the breakthrough hemorrhages, hemorrhages once you do the vitrectomy, the disease dies. I have hardly, have hardly seen any because I think that whole area becomes atrophic. That area of the choroid and the retina becomes atrophic or pigmented or what do you want to say? Some sort of a scar formation. Therefore, usually they do not come back with recurrence. Very rarely they come back with recurrence, at least for the next couple of years, they, unless or until a new growth comes somewhere else. So on when you get these massive hemorrhagic uh, detachments, I think, I mean, uh, you, you can, you pro, I mean, you can do vitrectomy and you can drain these uh, detachments in operatively. So these are, I mean, some of this thing. Therefore, it can be, well, therefore, as far as the management is concerned, one, it can be conservative without any intervention, especially, you know, if it's peripheral, it's a very small, it's not progressing. If it is somewhere within the, between the equator and the posterior pole, and it's not large, you can do ICG angiography, and after giving one or two shots of anti if the hemorrhage is reduced, you can give thermal laser and try and kill them. If you have larger hemorrhages, then you can give multiple doses of uh, intravitreal uh, aflibercept. If you have breakthrough hemorrhages, there is a surgical element that comes into the management. So, Giri, one, uh, suppose you do a vitrectomy in patients who present with uh, PCV or uh, a variant this peripheral PCV. So, after you have done the vitrectomy, which actually is a mechanical job of clearing the hemorrhage, but not treating the disease per se. Yeah. Do you do you inject uh, ilia at the same setting uh, at the oh, I, I, I don't inject ilia unless and until you know you see residual active subretinal hemorrhages. Yeah. Sometimes you know you do the this thing and still you see some pockets of hemorrhage like that. Then I give intravitreal antivirus on the operating table. But otherwise, if it is just a breakthrough hemorrhage and you know the area that has been involved, you can see that area is more or less getting you know healed up I like. Then I don't give any anti So if the look is whitish or becoming, yeah. uh, you know, atrophic areas, yeah. Yeah. then you don't. But if it is an active or reddish color lesion, or then you, yeah. Yeah, then you yeah. tend to give. So Ritesh, your take on peripheral PCV? Because I think it's a, it's a, it's an underdiagnosed entity, peripheral yeah. PCV. Yeah, yeah. It's an yes, underdiagnosed yeah. entity, and now people are also labeling it as a part of another spectrum of disease. Yeah, spectrum. Like, yeah, yeah. Peripheral hemorrhagic exudative polyretinopathy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, uh, in a patient who has a vitreous hemorrhage with this disease, very often uh, ultrasound, uh, people on ultrasound have misdiagnosed or confused it with melanomas with a hemorrhage also. So that's a differential one has to keep in mind when you're considering it. So ultrasound features are of a melanoma pretty characteristic on that. Uh, another thing which I, I don't know how useful it is, Dr. Kildar, that I generally do is if I see a hemorrhage, it is in the periphery, and I have a fear it might trickle down to the macula. I kind of barrage it off, also. Barrage it off. Okay. Yeah, and, and I don't use anti vagia for idea at the end. Generally, I don't use it. And as you rightly said, most of the time they don't come back. They just scar in that that subject. Yeah, I think uh, I this. Uh, so barrage laser is uh, probably a good idea. You don't lose anything. So, yeah, because you're doing in the periphery actually. Yeah, yeah. You you don't lose anything. That's a very sensible uh, approach. So let me ask one, uh, uh, maybe last question or what, what is your end point? So because vertiparin is not available, what is your end point in treatment of uh, 
of PCV? Endpoint of treatment is uh, at present. The endpoint is uh, absence of any activity on OCT. That's absence of serous macular detachment. Resolution of serous macular detachment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the that's the endpoint of treatment. I mean, basically, yeah, that's the endpoint of treatment. Because I feel in PCV, if there is activity, you have to treat. Because I'm always worried about the hemorrhagic element. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, some actually I had a patient recently, the one patient which I showed you, actually this patient actually had very little fluid. And, you know, some of these patients, unfortunately, you know, when who are receiving regular injections, you know, when they come with little fluid, they ask, is it necessary now? Can I wait for some time? And, you know, you just say, okay, you know, because basically they are also fed up. I mean, not fed up, but then they want to, you know, reduce the expenditure, etc. and all. And this lady came with a hemorrhage. So I'm always worried about hemorrhage and I, unlike wet, other forms of wet AMD where probably a type 1, if it is a type 1 neovascularization with a little SMD, probably I may, uh, you know, you, you, I mean, uh, uh, treated only if it's increasing, I may be a little fluid with stable vision. But in PCV, I feel this hemorrhagic component is always a scare. And I think if there is any form of activity, you have to treat. And if the after, OT, after the activity has reduced, do you always put them on treat and extend for a uh, uh, long time? Or, uh, uh, you, I, I uh, actually, as far as my TND protocol is concerned, in the first year, I initially give the loading dose and PRN and I study the, you know, the behavior. And then after that, once I'm convinced that, you know, these are patients who need very regular injections, then I ship them to TND. That's why usual, uh, the thing that for first six, seven, eight months, they are on a, initially on the loading dose and PRN. And if I find that the PRN intervals are very short, then I ship them into a treat and extend. And this treat and extend continues for life? Yeah, I mean, for quite some time, unless and until, you know, suppose now I find that the duration is really increasing very well. Now, you know, 8 weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 14, even after 14 weeks, uh, 12, 13 weeks, there is no fluid at all. Then possibly I may just tell the patient, okay, let us just see what happens. But then if I'm within about eight weeks itself with the fluid is recurring, then I, I mean, I would prefer to continue the TNT. So that, that means mon even if you give a drug holiday to this patient, that means monitoring still is important. Yeah, yeah monitoring is important. So Deepthi, any other questions you have on any other uh, channel or? Uh, that's all. So there are two small, quick questions. One is, is smoking a risk factor? And two, is there a role of TPA in large hemorrhagic? Uh, PCVs. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, and I mean, uh, large submacular hemorrhages, definitely TPA is, is useful, actually, and uh, uh, we, I give more of intravitreal TPA rather than, you know, uh, doing vitrectomy. Yeah, yeah I, I, mean, I mean, our results are quite very good, in fact, I mean, uh, this thing, and uh, second thing is, uh, what is it? Smoking. Yeah. Smoking, I mean, there is no, I don't think there is any evidence. I mean, is there any evidence? Uh, Nirula, I mean, uh, no, they, what, uh, what you see uh, with ARMD, 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 it has been listed, definitely. Uh, ARMD has been listed, smoking and uh, hypertension. Uh, Lalit, if you take the history of many of these patients, uh, if you ask them, do you smoke? They would have said, yes, we were smoking, we don't smoke now. So most <laughs> of them have stopped smoking. <laughs> <laughs> but so, the PSR literature, like Ritesh was pointing out, uh, like they may be two dissonant smoking and hypertension and antioxidants, they have been linked more to ARMD rather than to PCV. So these three things have been linked to ARMD and not to PCV. Therefore, we still believe that, you know, although there may be some overlap between, as was being pointed out, but by and large, maybe it's a, these are distinct entities uh, we are talking about. Any other thing? I Deepthi? think that's all the questions we have, sir. Thank you so much. I think that talk so, was very exhaustive and yet very lucid. Yeah. Um, and I think because it's a hot topic and a controversial one, I think our PGs are also quite, uh, you know, stimulated to go. But I have, I've actually, uh, Sudilji, can you just show that article? I think Dr. Giridhar has published an article in IGO in the July 2018 edition. So for the PGs, yeah, Once yeah. you yeah. log out of this, this it, is what it, you're uh, looking for. This was 2010, so this, I think. No, no, no this was the no, most no. Uh, 2018. The latest one. 18, 18, 18. Okay. This has all the recommendations and all your questions answered. <laughs> so this is one Thanks article. You. I think everybody, all of us should read this. Because as I said in my intro, uh, uh, Girdar has, uh, you know, uh, revised the management for us. In fact, he made us believe that uh, you can without, because we used to every time shout that ICG is not available, even in, uh, you know, developed centers. So 
OCT features are good enough to begin your treatment also and to suspect with reasonable degree of uh, accuracy. So this article is a master article. I think all of us uh, should have an access to this uh, and we, we can keep a copy of this. Uh, suppose you want to you know, revise your knowledge of uh, PCV. So thanks, uh, Giri, for uh, you know, thank, inviting thank you. the entire audience. You, I mean, and let me summarize you. two, three points because uh, uh, like the disease is confined to the between RP and the Brooks membrane. If people understand this, and they like you very rightly told difference between CSR and this uh, PCV. In CSR, you have a hypo, whereas in PCV, you have a you have a hyper moderate kind of hyper reflectivity there that can distinguish. And those six features, I think all of us should remember on OCT, the peak, peak PD, nosh PD, hemorrhagic, serous sanguinous, and subretinal hyperreflectivity and, and cavitation. This, I think, uh, all of us should uh, memorize. People can ask, what are the OCT features of PCV? Then can you, and the very important thing, flat irregular PD, which, uh, and double layer sign. This, if you remember this, uh, you know, OCT features, then flat irregular PD and double layer sign, I think you will memorize. And as far as management is concerned, management is concerned, combo is the best mode. But in the absence of that, ranimuzumab and Avastin are poor candidates. Are they not very good? So Ilia and uh, brodosumab may be the treatment of choice. And treat, treatment you should do uh, initially, you know, uh, loading dose followed by PRN. But don't lose these patients because sometimes hemorrhage is massive can occur. So you have to warn the patient that follow up is essential. So with this, I think uh, we can wind up uh, this uh, very important uh, uh, webinar for today. And again, thank uh, Giri on behalf of the entire Center for Zite team that uh, all of us uh, learned. We had good discussion also, and a lot of questions of the of the uh, you know this front people have been answered. So thanks once again, Giri. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lalit. Thank you, Santosh. Thank you, thank you so Vicky. Much. And uh, thank you, Ritesh, also. Nice seeing you all after a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Giri. I've been chasing you for three months and finally you're here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, actually, I'm not very much active in the Zoom uh, because I don't enjoy talking on the screen. I mean, uh, so, I mean, off late, I'm not very active. And uh, uh, last five, six months, seven months, yeah. So, actually, but then I thank you. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed uh, preparing for it. I enjoyed presenting it. And uh, Atush, it, we can, uh, the fact that he enjoyed, yeah. uh, the, the fact that he enjoyed, maybe we can have him again sometime. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I feel you should en encourage so many young people like Ritesh are there. So, you know. <laughs> so no, I agree. I agree totally. You know, physical conferencing, uh, yeah. there's no substitute actually. But yeah. the COVID taught us one thing yeah, that yeah, this know, exchange know, of information can happen. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, it has really made a phenomenal change. I mean, uh, and you know, the access to information and access to, I mean, uh, knowledge is really, you know, really revolutionized. You know, in the last any corner of the world, anyone presents, you're able to listen. So that really is a. So, did any announcement you have to do for the yes. one? So the next <laughs> next session is on March twenty third coming Wednesday. It will be on pathogenesis of serous detachments and CSR by Dr. Uh, Avnendra Gupta. So, so Giri, we do this program on every, we, Giri, we do this program on every Wednesday and Friday. Okay. And these retina modules are going on and we have... I, I, I mean, I think it's given a lot of... I mean, it's reaching the nook and corner of the country, I think. I mean, the information. Maybe I say of the world, in fact, not the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because the viewership, the viewership is uh, tremendous. Uh, and you see today, as soon as we uh, click off the button now, zoom off, this will be available on YouTube. YouTube, yeah. Santosh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a great, is, I, mean, I, 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 I mean, I wanted to start my talk uh, saying that, you know, the torch bearers of Indian ophthalmology, Lalit Verma and uh, Santosh Honava. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, we all, uh, unfortunately, that uh, little bit of confusion, you know, which I'm not, I, mean, I don't like all this. Actually, mm -hmm. in the evening around five o'clock, I, I, my, my IT manager, he told me, you just test it off with a, because we have got a Zoom license in the hospital. So he said, I will schedule a meeting and then, you know, we'll test it off. Unfortunately, my OP, you know, it got, because I had COVID very recently. So my outpatient, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was not, not working for nearly, I mean, uh, I, I think, I thought it's all over. 
<laughs> so I don't know. I think I became a little careless, and I landed up with one. Leather. So my OP, you know, stretched till about five thirty six, and by the time I came home, I mean, anyway, forget it. Okay, sorry, sorry for the. No, 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 no. I, I, I. You see, we learn from everything. I yeah. told you in the beginning itself. You see, if there's a problem, persist with patience. It will lead to success. Uh, Lalit, actually, since I'm seeing you, I thought I wanted to tell you about something. I think we must do, you know, something in the memory of Appa Swami. Yeah, yeah. And because it is, it is really, actually, when we had the in All India meeting here in Cochin last, actually, I invited him to, and I wanted to honor him during the inauguration. But unfortunately, even at that time, he was sick. So... I feel that you know we have to do something. Either the trade exhibition should be, you know, there. no, Giri, this is in the pipeline. This is yeah. in the agenda of governing council. Yeah, yeah. Something yeah. is being planned. We yeah, will yeah. Uh, come out definitely. Because, we will. Uh, we will... It really change. Actually, uh, Lalit, the first time I met Apaswami was when I was doing my PG in 1980. He came and met Professor Lamba in Pondicherry, and he gave a cryo machine for ICC. So yeah. he said, you know, in Tamil, he told him that you try it. I have developed it. You try it. So he was a young man, very young man at that time. So I still remember that. I, I, and, and surprisingly, you know, Lamba's classes will be in his in his uh, chamber. I know P.A. Lamba, he came from Lady Harding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So his class, he will conduct it. And we were all standing in one corner. like, <laughs> And then this guy, he called him inside and he just handed over this. So that is how he started way back in 1980. And I think he handed over this probably to RP Center also. And yeah, 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 yeah. No, we will, we will. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay, with this, I think let's call it a day and uh, hope to see you uh, yeah. physically soon in maybe yeah. Mumbai conference. Yeah, All yeah. of us, we yeah. are awaiting that. Yeah. So thanks, uh, Deepthi, uh, Ritesh, Santosh, and once again, Giri, thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you.